Even as special counsel Jack Smith prepares to take Donald Trump to trial over his attempts to steal the 2020 election, we are still learning new details three years later about the lengths the ex-president went to. As we've covered on the show before, back in November 2020, two Republican election officials in Wayne County, Michigan, initially refused to certify President Biden's victory there before changing their minds, voting to certify and ending the standoff. Just 30 minutes after that meeting ended, Trump called the two officials, urging them to reverse course again and go back to blocking Biden's victory. Now we know, finally, what Trump said on that call, thanks to great reporting by the Detroit News. Joined by none other than RNC Chair Ronna Romney McDaniel, Trump promised to provide attorneys for the two officials. He also told the pair they would look, quote, terrible if they signed the official certification document, adding, quote, we've got to fight for our country. We can't let these people take our country away from us. Following the call, the two canvassers then did try to do what Trump asked and undo their votes to certify Biden's victory. Thankfully, the plan did not work. The ship had sailed, as it were. Notably, when pressed about the calls three years ago, because we knew calls were happening, one of the election officials, Monica Palmer, said Trump was merely checking in on her well-being. <laughs> the portions of the call reviewed by the Detroit News did not include comments by Trump to that effect. We should note NBC News has not independently verified these recordings, but as the Detroit News notes, neither Palmer nor McDaniel and Trump, through spokespeople, disputed a summary of the call when contacted by the news. The second Wayne County canvasser, William Hartman, died in 2021. Joining me now are Lisa Rubin, MSNBC legal analyst, and George Conway, conservative attorney. There's a lot to talk about. I want to talk about the sort of new revelations coming out of Michigan and what they could mean, particularly what they might mean for both Jack Smith's case and other state-based cases. But also, because we've got this Supreme Court denial of cert before judgment, I want to get your reactions to it, because we've been sort of asking different legal folks what they think. George, if I'm not mistaken, you worked on the Jones v. Clinton brief on the side of Paula Jones, uh, which was an immunity case in a civil context, saying President Clinton should have to sit for a deposition. Uh, he was not entitled to immunity. You guys won that case 9-0, so you know immunity doctrine at the Supreme Court. What do you, what do you make of this cert petition denial? Yeah, I, I'm the only person, I think, in the universe who's written a brief that's defeated a claim of presidential immunity 9-0, I think. And, it, you know, I, I think today's order is not a big deal. I see a lot of people, their hair are, is on fire. They can just douse their hair in water because... This isn't a big deal. I don't think it's really going to affect the trial date that much. Uh, the worst case is it, the trial gets pushed to the summer. And the reason is, I think this, this, this order shows the weakness of Trump's uh, immunity case. And I think the court realizes uh, it's, got, it's got the D.C. circuit that's going to basically, it's going to hear argument on January 9th. It's not a hard case. I think they're going to move very quickly. If I were the presiding judge of the panel, I'd already be writing the opinion. And once they rule, they can lift the stay. They can issue a mandate and list the stay, which means then you're going to have Donald Trump saying, oh, we need expedition, we need expedition. And the Supreme Court could right. grant that and hear the case. They could hear it in April and May, decide right. it in June, decide it in May, and you still have a summer trial. Or... Better yet, they could deny the cert because he's right. already had his argument in the Court of Appeals before a very, very distinguished panel. And he can, Donald Trump should be, frankly, treated like every other criminal who's been convicted in a federal district court and, and be forced to litigate his arguments after his conviction. And, 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 and they can, he can challenge his conviction with every other claim after he's convicted and sentenced. So right. I, I just don't think this is a big deal. I think this case is going to get tried one way or the other in April, May, June, July. I, this case is going to trial, and Donald Trump is not going to be able to stop it. That's, that, that's an interesting. I mean, there's a few things, Lisa, there that are, that are interesting to me. One, a a Andrew Weissman talked about just sort of professional courtesy and deference from the Supreme Court to the D.C. Circuit, which, of course, is, is sort of the, the first among equals of appellate courts. It's sitting right there in D.C. So there's that. There's the advantage of, uh, to George's point, what I think is interesting is when you've got something that is pretty clear cut, rather than having one quite clear cut opinion in which Judge Hutton says, not a tough call, to have two. Not, you know, two opinions and say, this is not a tough call, and then take, take that. What do, you, what do you think? I Look, 
Chris, to the extent that the Trump brief was persuasive here, I think it was persuasive on the point that Judge Chutkin's opinion denying immunity for a criminal prosecution where you're talking about a sitting or former president is the first of its kind. And Trump's brief argued you, Supreme Court, should want to have another body of law before you before you make this most important of decisions. We're not disagreeing that this eventually warrants your review. We're just saying not now. And I thought that was probably the most persuasive argument hmm. in their brief. In terms of what I think the D.C. Circuit is going to do, I tend to think that this D.C. Circuit is going to make a decision on immunity that's more symmetrical with the rule in civil cases and say, yes, maybe a president is entitled to immunity where you're talking about allegedly criminal actions at the outer periphery of their official duties. But based on the allegations in this indictment, taking them on their face, what they are alleging that he did doesn't even get close to that periphery and therefore right. the case can be tried. I think they want the cover of a D.C. Circuit opinion that says that. Based on a decision earlier this month in a civil context, I in the D.C. Circuit, I think the D.C. Circuit is well positioned to extend that rule to the criminal context and give the court the cover that it needs. Yeah, this is the outer perimeter sort of doctrine that 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 is both sort of I think suggested by other cases in this line and also explicitly invoked uh, uh, in the Trump in the Trump brief. Uh, George, let's talk about uh, what's coming out of Michigan because what's there's a few things striking about it to me. One is that they, I don't know where did they get the tape from. <laughs> now we got the tape, but also just like it's so wild how in the weeds the guy was. I mean, that's the president of the United States. Like you know this because you have worked. You've worked in politics and you've been around the various layers uh, that go around principles, as they're often called, right? Uh, who they talk to on the phone. What's a staff job? What's the principal's job? Like, the president on the phone with the wing county <laughs> canvassers, it's just like there's nothing he won't do. There's no, there's no lengths he won't go to to get this done. Yeah, I mean, he's a complete nut job. And uh, it's just like what he did in Georgia. Remember, he didn't just call Secretary of State Raffensperger. He called an investigator, uh, a, a lowly investigator in the Georgia Department of whatever. I don't even know what it is. And, right. and to, 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 to jawbone that poor woman, she's getting talking to the president of the United States, this nut job. And so, I, you know, it's just crazy. It just shows you what a lunatic he is and how extreme he is and how corrupt he is, because this is just he's basically on the basis of lies, on the basis of no facts. He's urging a public official to basically violate their oath to, to the law of the state of Michigan and to the Constitution. It's crazy and corrupt. And I got to say this about my former political party. You know, I mean, Ron Romney McDaniel, the woman who changed her name, so that it wouldn't displease Donald Trump. I mean, I mean, this is just the sleaziest thing ever. Whether or not it's criminal, we'll set that aside. It's just the sleaziest thing ever. And if my former political party had any decency or, or shame, uh, she'd be out on her ass. Uh, forgive my language. Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I, I do find it actually quite revealing and, and shocking that she's that she's on the call and she's saying we'll yeah. we'll pay for your lawyers as well. There's yeah. also an interesting angle to this, Lisa, which is. We have seen, I mean, and I think this is a sort of a little bit of a funny Willis effect, which is, you know, all eyes were on the Justice Department from the beginning of this. But it, mm. it's pretty clear that there are all sorts of colorable claims in a bunch of jurisdictions that state law was violated. And now we've seen cases brought against, you know, uh, the, the sort of fake electors in Michigan. There's a case now in Nevada. There's maybe one coming in, in Arizona. There is the one in Georgia that names them. That there, there were, alongside with the federal case and the Fonnie Willis case, there were many state laws <laughs> that plausibly were broken in pursuit of this scheme. That's absolutely true. And we now know, Chris, based on this reporting, that there were at least four recorded calls. There are the two calls that George was mentioning earlier in Georgia to Brad Raffensperger and the woman who was the investigator. Her name is Frances Watson. Then there was the call that just got reported in Michigan. And I also want to remind you that there's a fourth call to now deceased Georgia House Speaker David Ralston, who provided a copy of that recording right. to the special purpose grand jury that Fonnie Willis convened. So we now know that this guy who infamously doesn't text, doesn't email, was foiled by the smartphone era and by a bunch of quick thinking folks who, when he made these very granular, weedy calls to the Wayne County commissioners, 
fired up the phone and fired up the otter, I guess, to record right. him having these conversations, giving rise to, as you note, potentially some state law claims, but yes. also additional evidence of the wrongdoing in Jack Smith's case. Yes. Also, you're firing up the recorder, the, the, the iPhone recorder, not because you're like, this is a cool souvenir. You're firing it up as Brad Raffensperger because like, this is really legally objectionable. And I immediately need some evidence to cover myself from, from what might be a blatant act of criminality. I think that's fairly clear. If in I all were of this. going into a, into a phone call with a criminal, I would record it too. And let me, there's yeah, one right. other thing too. I mean, we forget about the one other call, the one that, almost happened. Remember Governor Doug Ducey, when he was right. signing the electoral certificates, he's sitting there, the press is there, they're taking the pictures and da da da, da. Yep. And all of a sudden, his Trump. phone rings in his pocket. It's hail to the chief. <laughs> dun, dun, da, da. And he takes his phone out of his pocket and puts it down and turns it off. <laughs> I mean, Trump is so it's, true. It's completely insane. I forgot insane. that detail. I forgot that <laughs> and, detail. And, and, and one thing about the state laws, I mean, you know, here it's... um. I think the one wrinkle to this particular case, I think if I were the defense lawyers here for Ronna, Romney, McDaniel, and Donald Trump and whoever, um, the thing they got going for them is that these people had already certified the results. They'd already done and it, And they yeah. didn't have the power to uncertify it. So in a yeah. sense, they were, they were being asked to do something they couldn't Infinite. do, and that may have, yeah. that could affect the legal, uh, a legal effect yes. of what they did. And, but other than that, it's just sleazy, sleazy it's, as hell. And it can be used in Jack Smith's case, which I think can go to trial yeah. in March and April, as I said, and in, and in Fonnie Willis's case to show their yep. criminal intent.